Hello and welcome to Planning with Co-Creative Minds, Community Experiments and Engagement in Hong Kong and London, which is a joint initiative of the Royal Town Planning Institute and the Hong Kong Institute of Planners. I am Michele Vianello, the RTPI's International Policy and Research Officer, and I will be chairing this webinar today. Uh, this webinar is part of a renewed engagement between the RTPI and the Hong Kong Institute of Planners uh, under the RTPI Emerging International Strategy. We are particularly happy to have an opportunity to engage young planners and facilitate an exchange of ideas today, uh, particularly because um, London, from uh, which Gabriel is from, is our biggest uh, English region, and Hong Kong hosts the largest community of RTPI members overseas. Um, we're also quite keen to um, make this happen because currently we are um, seeing a huge debate in England around the planning reform that are being discussed. And uh, recently, the RTPI has published a, a research paper called Planning Through Zoning that reviews how zoning works uh, in different parts of the world, including Hong Kong, which is highlighted as a is an, an example of um, a, a hybrid system where zoning um, is um, mixed with discretionary measures. And another issue that will be central in the debate in the coming months will certainly be uh, community engagement and participation. So we're very glad to host this discussion today with the next generation of planners uh, and RTPI members. So before I introduce the speakers, um, I would recommend that all attendees familiarize themselves with the um, dialog box of the GoToWebinar platform we, we are using today. And in the dialog box, you should be able to see a drop down menu uh, called questions. And if you press on that, you will see a relatively intuitive um, interface that will allow you to uh, pose questions to the speakers. I will uh, select some of those and ask them um, to the speakers at the end of their presentations. And without further ado, let me introduce our speakers today. We will first hear from Kate Kwok, hello Kate, a co-convener uh, for the Community Planning Committee at the Hong Kong Institute of Planners. Kate has been actively involved in community planning and empowerment initiatives since she was a student and has now 10 years of experience in professional urban and transport planning and traffic engineering in Hong Kong and the wider Southeast Asia region. She will be presenting on the market development in Sham Shui Po, where a community of vendors successfully turned an unauthorized market into an authorized one. She will demonstrate uh, through this project how community planning can work in Hong Kong. After Kate, we will hear from Jeffrey. Uh, please be advised that Jeffrey and Kate will use the same screen at the Hong Kong Institute of Planners, so you will see them both on that screen. Um, and Jeffrey is an advisor at the Hong Kong Public Space Initiative and steering committee member of the NGO WOC DVRC, which stands for Deve Road Central, which promotes pedestrian-oriented solutions in the Hong Kong uh, CBD. Jeffrey is a town planner who has been working with engagement and educational programs uh, on public space and planning in Hong Kong. And he will be presenting the vision being promoted by Walk DVRC for the uh, pedestrianization redesigning of the roads in ways that enable social uses of the streets and uh, active travel. Finally, our third speaker today will be Gabriela Pia, who is a member of the RTPI General Assembly and also a committee member of the London branch of the Women in Planning Network, uh, promoting gender equality in the planning profession. Gabriel is a community engagement project coordinator working in London and the southeast of England and an advocate for greater progress in diversity and inclusion, both in the planning profession and in the places that planners help to create. Gabriel will share a range of community engagement projects, highlighting the approaches that ensure diversity and inclusion in the process. Uh, so thank you very much for being here today, to the three of you and to all our attendees. And I will now uh, make um, Kate, our first presenter, and um, give you the floor. Please, Kate. Thank you. Let me now share my screen. Uh, should be this one. All right. All right. Uh, 
Sorry. Mine is down. Okay. Okay. I'll just take this down. So, okay. Um, to talk about community planning in Hong Kong, uh, I will begin with um, a brief introduction of the planning system in Hong Kong. So the planning system in Hong Kong consists of three tiers, and the first one is the territorial level. And uh, we have this territorial development strategy, and the latest version is the Hong Kong 2030 Plus. It is a strategy that provides broad planning uh, guidelines for future development and infrastructure provision in Hong Kong. And it also forms the basis for uh, preparing district plans at, at different levels. So um, to inform this uh, planning process, uh, uh, the government has um, conducted a citywide public engagement program. Uh, although this is not statutory, but uh, it is common to see large scale public engagement programs for uh, planning studies of this scale. And the second level is the district level. And uh, we have the statutory outline zoning plan, uh, which, is, uh, which shows the land use zones, development restrictions, and other major road systems of uh, different planning areas. And uh, since 2004, the town planning ordinance was amended to uh, increase the openness and transparency of this planning system. And as we can see from the flowchart to your right, the procedures for uh, processing planning applications in Hong Kong has included a new um, three-week public inspection and comment period from 2005 onwards. So um, through this, uh, the uh, public comments uh, received from this three-week period was actually uh, submitted to a town to a town planning board, which is a statutory body to handle planning applications. And um, although these um, comments uh, or, or the three-week period is statutory, uh, whether or not or, or to what extent these comments are in, uh, integrated or in, incorporated into the final decision making is up to the town planning board. And so for the uh, last year is the local planning level. And for this level, we have outline development plans and layout plans, which are administrative in nature and it usually used to uh, guide uh, facilities planning internally within the government. So uh, we can see here, we do not have institutional framework on community planning. And uh, a team of young planners and myself, we have been working uh, to fill this policy gap uh, in, with local communities. And from our observation, to practice community planning in Hong Kong, we actually need three elements. The first one is we need an empowered community and we need the support from the professional circle. And we also need the support from the institution, like uh, the local authorities and the district councils. We need all three to make it work. So now I'm going to share my uh, project experience um, uh, in Sam Shui Po to turn an illegal dawn market. As you can see from the picture to your left, it, it is uh, a market that runs from, uh, I think, midnight to 5 to 6 a.m. in the morning by a, a group of low-income people who cannot afford the rent. So they bring their products to the street and um, to sell uh, during this night time to avoid being arrested. And so they would like to uh, strive for an authorized market during daytime so they can make a living with dignity and um, without the fear of being prosecuted. So um, this project, uh, it was started by a group of hawkers uh, from this illegal market and some local residents uh, together with some social workers. And they started by doing a site search in some in, in the neighborhood uh, on some idle spaces and they do their own site analysis. They um, look at the area, the accessibility, um, the pedestrian flow and all the surrounding uh, facilities uh, with their own local knowledge. And uh, during this uh, whole uh, selection process, they maintained a continuous communication with local authorities and the district council. And uh, for, our, for us planner, we joined this uh, project uh, during this selection uh, uh, period. And uh, we actually commented on those sites shortlisted by the, the, the group, the hawkers, and then uh, we help them decide on the final sites. And so after deciding on the sites, uh, we actually uh, started uh, the community planning workshops. And so we formed a scheme uh, based on the operational practices of these hawkers. And then uh, we also include both hardware, the layout of the site, and then we uh, and, and the software, the management side, like um, the operational hours and things like that. So uh, 
we with the consensus of all the stakeholders on these two things we proceeded to organize lobbying sections with uh, the residents in the neighborhood and uh, we maintain a dialogue with the local community and to address the concerns uh, for this um, for this market as you can see from the plan on the uh, to your to your right and it's actually the first draft of our plan and we submitted this to the government and we consulted uh, the residents uh, nearby uh, with this plan and so this is uh, a picture of our market on our first market date as you can see it's a very simple layout and very simple setup is a holiday market and uh, people joining they are mostly uh, low income people and they had uh, many different kinds of stores uh, game stores and even a, a public uh, space in the in the middle for some kind of events during the day and the market turned out to be a big success and according to a survey done by an NGO on our first market date 82% uh, of the residents or the people interviewed thinks this market uh, is a good platform for a social gathering and uh, to um, to know more about uh, different people within the neighborhood and 91.2% thinks um, this market uh, was a good way to make use of underutilized public space and another um, Another thing that we are very happy about is the, our zero complaint record. Uh, we actually have this uh, mechanism to respond to uh, any complaint uh, from the local residents. We have this hotline so people can call if they find anything that is uh, that, that they are not happy with uh, this market. For example, if uh, they have uh, some, they are they complain about excessive noise, then our volunteers will go over to uh, to find the source of the noise. Maybe it's a loudspeaker, and then we will solve the problem before any formal uh, complaint was lodged to the government. So, um, with this a good track record, we actually set a good precedent for uh, other holiday markets in different uh, parts of Hong Kong. So this is actually a milestone in the long-term market development in Hong Kong. As you can see, uh, holiday markets actually they grew in size, uh, more and more stores, different kinds of stores, and um, we have a higher diversity of uh, activities within these markets. And so uh, this is one of the uh, projects and our team, uh, we continue to experiment with other uh, local needs uh, that we can, uh, we can see. For example, we work on public market uh, complex. We design the complex floor by floor with local residents. And then we try to, um, in another neighborhood in Kennedy Town, we try to combine different local issues like uh, traffic, uh, community facilities, public space, or urban design, and we combine it into a community a vision building exercise. So this is another way to address uh, local concerns. And then in Twin Moon, we work on air pollution uh, from a spatial perspective. We work with uh, an NGO called Clean Air Network uh, to uh, to identify the sources of air pollution locally, and then we try to propose quick win solutions to it. And then, lastly, another interesting project is the transitional uh, housing co-design uh, exercise. We did it with some uh, subdivided units residents. Uh, they um, they would like to. Um, plan for a better living condition through this uh, transitional housing proposal. And then we uh, submitted this proposal to the government. And through these uh, kind of projects, uh, actually we think, and we can observe that we are building this circle of community empowerment. And uh, first it was some bottom up community initiatives and through continued uh, dialogue with local authorities and uh, district councils and with the support of uh, professionals, we actually uh, can implement some of them. So the imp implemented plans can uh, reinforce the, the, uh, the confidence of local people, reinforce their sense of belonging, identity to the community, and then they are more willing to act on uh, things they, they want to change within the community and then they will uh, more of them can uh, join this bottom-up community initiatives so this uh, virtuous circle is happening in many different uh, neighborhoods in Hong Kong so we are happy to see that and we think this is um, an important element for community planning to further develop in Hong Kong so to conclude uh, three elements for community planning in Hong Kong in future so that's it uh, for my sharing now. So thank you for listening.
Kate, thank you very much for that. It was quite fascinating to see how um, practice can address gaps in, in the policy and try to fill them and inspire new ways of thinking about policy. Uh, and now we're going to listen from Jeffrey. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Okay. Hello, my friends from UK and Hong Kong. Uh, what I'm going to share is our uh, experience and dealing with the public space and time planning in Hong Kong. So um, I will share my experience uh, to in uh, three years ago uh, when we deal with the uh, opens up the uh, the rural central as a pedestrian uh, pedestrian zone. So to me, time planning is uh, it's like uh, other city. Uh, uh, land resources is very scarce in Hong Kong, so we need to strike a balance in different competing uses, demand for housing, uh, commerce, industrial use, or transport use. So, uh, as case that uh, we have a uh, over overarching framework to guide the city's development, which is Hong Kong 2030 Plus. And uh, we have the hierarchy, but you cannot see the uh, bottom up. Uh, community planning in this hierarchy. So we need to fill the gaps inside. So you can see the ordinance, the time planning board, which is a statutory bodies. And so we would take the lead to adapting and creating a community engagement exercise. And when we uh, partnership, we will have partnership with different NGOs. And we can see uh, this is, uh, you, you guys might be very familiar with this. This is letter of uh, community participation. So we need to move up upward to make our city uh, not just being involved, our members not just being involved, but uh, try to engage more in the uh, decision-making exercises. So uh, to me, uh, planners should be broad and innovative to convince the decision-maker, which is very important, uh, the authority, the government to take risk, at least take some risk in uh, sharing and controlling the authority with the community. So uh, my experience is uh, the public space. We need to transform the space, which is made, which maybe looks dull or uh, which um, maybe not fully utilized to transform it into places which everybody's enjoy. So as you can see in the picture, there is a lot of diverse concern. Government would like to control everything. No. Uh, uh, littering, no bike cycling in the parks and local areas. Business sector may want to have uh, more uh, development opportunities, business opportunities. The public, you see in the picture, uh, all kinds of busking, uh, picnicking, uh, enjoying the public space. And also the designer, which is the urban planner and the designers would like to have more innovative design. Is bound by the, uh, uh, I mean the uh, current legislative structures. So you can see different people, different stakeholders have different uh, diverse concerns here. So we need to strike a balance and stretch the optimal balance between the formality or informality, civic or market oriented. So um, to me, it's uh, in uh, I mean, it's an uh, infinity uh, searching for for this optimum balance because uh, it's not easy to get a uh, a balance between all these parties. So the rural central is uh, within the our CBD uh, in central uh, in Hong Kong. So we initiate a scheme which is called the uh, proposed tram and pedestrian uh, area in this the DVLC with were set in soft form. So it is um, like at the heart of the central CBD. It's around uh, 1.4 km uh, length, which is we want to make it into a green alley. Um, we want to make it a open up as a public space. So we need to see how it looks like. Um, in the current days, you see lots of people traveling uh, in uh, the DVLC area and lots of buses, uh, heavy traffic. You can see the buses uh, or the uh, private cars, even the loading and unloading air, uh, activities along the street. And also uh, for people, uh, people who look stout and not so happy, you see, uh, it's maybe due to the poor air quality. And uh, a lot of jaywalking, you can see uh, there is lack of um, enough, uh, I mean, road closing uh, facilities. And you can see the, the, the truck 
uh, over there. And uh, occupation of those public space by the construction materials and lack of uh, sufficient uh, duty first uh, facilities for the crossing, for the, especially for the, for the elderly and also the disabled persons. So uh, we would like to make it a, a green alley uh, linking up all the historical elements because uh, our CBD is uh, full of uh, our colon uh, co uh, colonial history. So you can see uh, the central market, which is uh, the greater building, Tycoon PMQ, which is also the uh, very eye-catching uh, historical building. And we have local culture as well. You can see uh, at the uh, left-hand side, there is a, a dry seafood shops uh, and the central market. So we can make use of those uh, historical elements to inject the vibrancy into the green alley. So um, I think um, we learned a lesson from uh, the overseas examples, for example, and this is uh, from US, uh, the New York Times Square pedestrian nice scheme in, in outside the, the Times Square. Uh, uh, this example must be very familiar with you. Uh, the Oslo Street pedestrian nice scheme, uh, which will be implemented in London and uh, Copenhagen as well. So Hong Kong, we would like to make it a green alley full of uh, green, uh, you can see the trees, but we inject more urban furniture, easier for people cross the street, and uh, we left the link, I mean the, the, the environmental friendly tramways still there, and uh, at least one link for the minimal uh, traffic, uh, for, the, for the necessary traffic, just like uh, the buses and also the private cars. So at least, uh, the air can be improved. So this is our illustration for the new DVLC. Yeah. So if you have some time, you can click on our link uh, to see the videos. So uh, for me, uh, the air quality of DVLC is very poor. So we need to uh, improve by this scheme. We improve the air quality because it's uh, what we call is canon effect. The uh, emission from the cars will be trapped uh, along the DVLC, so and cannot escape uh, the area. So another example is uh, the traffic speed in central. This part is extremely slow. So the vehicle speed is uh, less; uh, is around 10 km per hour. So it is not uh, so uh, efficient to put the cars here. So we suggest to divert the buses and also the trucks uh, in the uh, and the length near the harbor front. And also uh, the more, uh, the pedestrian space, as you can see in the pictures just now, is uh, very scarce, uh, it's marginalized. The, the public space or the pedestrian space is clearly uh, minimal. So the side walking is narrow to the, it's very narrow. So people sometimes need to jaywalk or uh, need to walk on the, on the road. And also we need to think about the social inclusion for the public space for all, not just um, the normal people, but also the social inclusion for the elderly and also the uh, disabled persons. So we need to make a, uh, what, what we call is a fairer sharing between cars and pedestrian. And as, as I said, uh, to make more uh, uh, streetscape improvement. Uh, for example, the paving, uh, the, uh, street furniture, as you can see in the picture, and create a neighborhood which uh, everybody enjoys. So um, I think this project we take very long time because uh, it's not easy to to implement a, such a big project, especially in CBD uh, in 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 Hong Kong. So uh, our institute uh, started the. Uh, proposal. It's a very preliminary proposal back in uh, 2000. And we spent uh, lots of years uh, to prepare the, uh, you, you can imagine the traffic impact assessment, uh, the scheme, uh, the layout. And, and finally, to uh, uh, 2016, we have a trial event, at least we have something tried before. And which is, uh, which is a important success. Uh, we close up uh, not 1.4 kilometers, which is very long and is not acceptable by the government. So we close, close up, or you can you can call it open up uh, a 200 meter um, uh, 
area of DVLC as a trial scheme on one Saturday, uh, on one Sunday afternoon. So you can see uh, we. Uh, we, we we have the lawn there, and uh, the tramways cooperate with us, and uh, and you can see the polling there. Yeah, um, most of people support uh, the scheme, and uh, we have variety of uh, sports, music, and uh, arts and culture uh, things, educational stuff over there. So I think um, this experience uh, gives me. Uh, Give us a a a a, a trial of oh, what uh, public space can be, but uh, we do uh, have lots of challenge. Uh, for example, a balance between the safety and experience. Okay, you can see in the picture. This picture is good illustration between the reality and the imagination. So in the reality, you can see as required by the government departments, there is uh, lots of fencing. You can see. We have to fence off. Uh, we have to pro uh, I mean, I mean, provide a rather safe environment for the for the participants. So a uh, lot of fencing, which may not be very good uh, to the to the uh, I mean the participants. And limited event space, you can see uh, it's no, it's rather narrow uh, currently. So uh, it's uh, the uh, public participation may not be like that. And the what what makes us uh, very painful is the approval process. As we take lots of time to deal with uh, various uh, government department, transport department, police uh, authority, and also uh, highways, tramways, bus company to make the event uh, possible. So uh, we have to apply to the government for the public space entertainment license. Um, especially, they they don't allow us to have food on the street. So uh, it's a separate license. So we do not have uh, enough time or enough resources to make another license. So we, on, on that day, we do not provide uh, any food. It's what a pity, right? Okay. And finally, for funding, because uh, uh, it's lot, it requires lots of funding. And unlike uh, the government sector or the business sector, we have lots of funding to do this kind of events. So just imagine, uh, we have to raise funds uh, from uh, different sectors, uh, business sectors to, oh, say, uh, okay, this is possible in Hong Kong, just make one day, uh, let's have a try. Okay, so uh, in these courses, uh, lots of effort to, to, I mean, to raise the fund. Yeah, so, and the next year, uh, we would like to have a bold idea, which is uh, a 90 day, uh, uh, I mean, more intensive trial in the DVLC to promote the walkable city. So um, this is the illustration. Uh, uh, we close off um, longer uh, streets. Yeah, um, and even we put the street pavilions there and make it more attractive, not all close off or not, uh, I mean, uh, is all, all fencing or, or the areas. And also, we we uh, we also treasure the local culture, uh, which is the uh, Chinese plants and herbs. Okay, so we can have some plantings uh, or what you call urban farms there, and uh, people can appreciate that. And uh, in the Shenwan uh, a Cultural Plaza, which is the end of the DVLC, uh, this is not a street. This is a a, a cultural plaza. Uh, we would like to make it a food market. Yeah, you can see. Uh, uh, it's like a bazaar or a food market, and a, and yeah, and there's, you can see there's some uh, local elements there, and there uh, there is a uh, performance space uh, at the night. So we co we also cooperate with Chanways. Uh, I mean, uh, to promote those performance space uh, for the artists. In Hong Kong, so I think uh, this is the uh, local project. Uh, I mean, featuring the local values of Hong Kong. So it's not only a a, a project about CBD, but it's owned by Hong Kong people. So uh, thanks for <laughs> your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Uh, that was uh, a really interesting presentation. Um, I'll, I'll uh, now give the floor to Gabrielle. Um, and to do that, I will share the pres her presentation directly uh, from my laptop. So 
please give us just a moment while we do that. Um, Okay, that should be it. Apologies for the small glitch, technical mm -hmm. glitch. Can I it's just confirm good. that you're seeing the presentation I can. all right? I hope you can. Excellent. Please, Gabrielle, uh, the floor is yours. Let me know when I need to switch to the following slide. Will do. Okay, thank you so much, Kate and Jeffrey, for sharing your experience in Hong Kong. Um, I'm Gabrielle, and I'm a project coordinator at Soundings, as um, Michele explained, and I'll be talking about the London context for planning with co-creative minds and community experiments and engagement. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so what I wanted to kind of talk through to start with is the policy context um, for planning and development and community engagement in the UK and London. Um, and then uh, from my experience working at Soundings, I wanted to talk through the principles and methods for best practice community engagement um, and especially for the inclusive creation of places. And we can't ignore um, the impact that coronavirus is having on our experience and the work that we do. Um, so I was also going to touch on the um, uh, the move towards remote engagement and ensuring that there's still inclusivity in the planning and development process um, in that. And then obviously we're, we're thinking about the parallels and also the differences between London and Hong Kong um, in that planning and engagement context. So hopefully that will weave through the presentation, but we'll talk more about that in, in the discussion at the end. So in terms of the UK's planning policies, uh, I think we share some similarities with Hong Kong in the fact that it is tiered at the national level. Um, we did have uh, the Localism Act and Neighbourhood Planning Act, which enabled um, and gave powers to local groups, parishes and towns um, to allow them to engage in a democratic process to shape the places um, that they live and work in. Um, and then the national planning policy framework uh, came along and consolidated uh, planning policy statements and planning policy guidance notes um, and promotes the role of public planning. Um, it also strengthened strengthen the position of local plans and um, clearly articulated the need for early engagement and recognises that early participation is beneficial for all parties, developers, the communities, and that it has a value that avoids kind of costly mistakes and applied the kind of idea of um, financial benefit as well to some extent um, and now we have the white paper I won't delve into that one but uh, that's a new uh, policy that's coming forward that kind of has a digital first approach and the idea of digital democracy and front-loading local plans um, but we'll, we're yet to see how that's going to impact on, on the process um, and then next slide please Michele. And then on the London level, um, you should see on the next slide, uh, there's the London plan. Um, and generally, the development approach uh, is that uh, it, the development approach in London, sorry, is thinking about the growing population, the need for new homes, um, a kind of mixed use, compact, well connected, and sustainable city. Um, and, and that's Kind of what the London plan pushes for is a spatial development strategy, um, which local plans have to conform to, as well as neighbourhood plans. Um, and each local borough, uh, London is split, into, split up into boroughs, um, is expected to produce a statement of community involvement as to how communities will be engaged in, in um, shaping places. And then beyond that, um, we're seeing more London centric. Um, uh, policies such as estate regeneration ballots that allow um, communities to kind of vote for um, redevelopment of, of their homes um, and a general just good growth by design and involving people as as a kind of uh, policy context for London. Thank you Michele, next slide. So I just wanted to um, give a little bit of background to Soundings. Uh, started off as an architecture practice and um, 
kind of was very very interested in co-design and bringing communities into the process of, of design and so the independent the soul community engagement organization came out of that as soundings uh that was back in 2007. next slide please Um, and I think a really important part of the work that we do is that we're made up of interdisciplinary um, people, architects, artists, um, but, but we all have the common goal of um, kind of making sure that we uh, effectively engage communities. And um, next slide, please. I was just going to flip through these ones. So, um, and we also have a range of clients, public and private, uh, which also impacts the way that we're working in, and shaping places. Um, next slide, please. Uh, but the the wise kind of overarching principle is that we're making better places through active participation and we've been doing this for over 15 years as Londoners and um, and like Nikele said in the South East as well. Next slide please. Um, and I think a really important part of interpreting the, the kind of national and London policy is that um, we focus on people and um, their understanding of place and their priorities and aspirations for space and then the place itself and um, what that can provide for, pe for people and then the, just that joint narrative and thinking about how um, we can best uh, plan for them. Next slide please. And uh, just to say that we're kind of recognised for the fact that we um, to understand the importance of both the client and the user and balance that to create places um, and the client obviously can be arranged from public to private and then the users being a range of community groups. Next slide. <laughs> and then generally like I said our principles are that local people are the experts um, and so in all the work that we do when it's client facing you're kind of it, helping them understand that it is the people that are there that know Kind of no best um, and the vested interest in um, the future and um, you know finding a representative voice and making sure that as many groups in the community are um, heard and understood listening and having empathy for the fact that like like you've been saying Hong Kong there's there's um, uh, people have a very emotional relationship with the places that they live and, and work in and changing that will affect um, a lot of things and understanding the barriers to um, being involved um, and making sure that things are these conversations are happening quite early um, a common language uh, making sure that we're not using jargon educating people not just um, on a single development but about the wider planning process and then in that giving people a voice and building consensus among amongst communities next slide please Michele, next slide, please. Sorry if I can't see it. And um, just the first, <laughs> yeah, so just from the, the first stage of our engagement is always thinking about the research and the area um, before talking about any specific development, um, and that's just what what this kind of, this slide kind of speaks to and ensuring inclusivity in that process we must remember that commun our communities are rich and diverse and comp composed of people who need and want to communicate in a variety of different ways so now i'll draw on some some of the specific project examples for that next couple of slides please oh we've gone backwards next slide please Um, so one major example that I wanted to draw on is the Olympic Park and the Olympic legacy globally, um, where different Olympic um, Games have been held. It's been a huge part to think about the legacy of that space and how it's going to be used in the future. Um, and uh, in the London context, uh, there was the, the understanding that the Development Corporation actually did consider um, the legacy ahead of time um, and worked across boroughs for this particular space to 
um, create an area that would benefit loads of different communities. So um, if you pop to the next slide, I came into planning as being part of the Legacy Youth Board for um, the Olympic Park. Uh, and, and they were already considering how the, um, the venues, the sports venues um, would be used, removing temporary ones, keeping certain ones, but also introducing educational institutions and um, cultural institutions to the space. So this was an exhibition that we held for um, UCL, uh, University College London, bringing a new university to the Olympic Park. And the way this image kind of shows that we provided engagement that would um, cater for different different groups. So you can see quite stereotypically that we've got older people that are looking at the printed um, uh, the printed boards giving explanations of of the principles and designs for for the new space and then young people were able to engage by coming in looking at the ipads um sitting in the bean bags and it was just a really amazing space to bring people into to in, engage differently in, in a different range of ways but be able to effectively input to the, into the plans next slide please and there was also a um, legacy youth board, like I said, that I was on before the Olympics had even happened to start to plan forward as to what the, the whole Olympic Park could look like. Um, so, you know, that kind of demonstrates the idea of um, working with different groups and uh, working across boroughs because it was all different borough representatives to um, come together for a, for a common goal and, and for a great output, which is now the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. Next slide, please. So that's just a, a picture of engaging with the legacy youth voice and board. Next slide, please. And then I just wanted to change the scale to, so these are um, some gas holders in Marion Place. And in, in London and across the UK, we're now redeveloping our gas holders into new homes. And um, these are considered a huge landmark in Bethnal Green. I'm from Bethnal Green. It was a project that was close to my heart. And um, through uh, walk and talks uh, and talking to these groups that really specially used this area, which were the artists community, um, and uh, kind of BME groups, we were able to build a design that would and kind of negotiate with the community between the community. And this one was a private developer um, to create a kind of uh, common goal. And if you go to the next slide, um, the proposal that has now been approved is going to provide affordable workspace from the conversations that the developers and the architects had with the community a public open space that opens up Regent's Canal, which has been closed off to the community for hundreds of years. Um, and behind the gas holders will be a huge new green open space and affordable housing built within um, what is quite an expensive site, a gas holder site. Um, so again, just thinking about how, um, you know, uh, reaching out to the specific groups that we know um, were kind of uh, core and local um, had built these conversations to create a scheme such as this. And then the next one, please. Um, and then my next example is Cambridge Road Estate, uh, which is um, one of our first estate regeneration projects, which received an overwhelmingly positive ballot. Um, and that was because we um, kind of did a first stage of engagement where we really understood the needs of um, estate residents, got to know the residents, didn't just come to them with an idea, first of all, of, oh, this is what, what we want to build, um, but, uh, and also um, tailored our events. So there were a, a lot of uh, Muslim women on the estate. So we did women only events so that they would feel comfortable coming and engaging with, um, with the team to talk about the plans for building them new homes. We had um, interpreters and uh, re refugee group specific events. We did door knockings to make sure that every single resident knew what was happening and that they were informed, but that they also could feedback to us in a way that they didn't have to come along to events if they, ne if they couldn't necessarily come. And like I said, um, that resulted in an overwhelmingly positive ballot. And we always showed how their feedback, always tracked how their feedback um, changed the development response and, and um, went through stages of, of development with them for for the plans next one please and that was a joint venture partnership between the local authority and the developer 
um, working closely together to make that one. Whereas Yorkware Estate is is an infill project um, where we're proposing to build new homes on an existing estate. And for this, it's a, uh, a really big um, contention in UK planning is is um, open space and views and privacy and things like that. So these are the kinds of um, values that we're working with here. And to do that, we're working, um, doing really focused workshops with residents to think about how they use the open spaces at the moment and how um, a new development, new homes um, can uh, kind of create benefit of improving the existing outdoor facilities. Um, and if you pop to the next slide, you'll see that we also recognise that it is the children who are using these spaces the most and that there was the need to engage them really deeply in, in the idea of what these new spaces could provide for them, um, how they use the space already and um, we're, yeah, we're working through that at the moment, that's an ongoing project. And the next slide uh, shows how we currently um, doing engagement remotely. We, we used to have this community centre where we'd hold, hold all of our events and people were coming in, but now everything kind of has to be um, done separately from the community. So we're, we're, uh, we've been printing things and putting it out onto the estate for people to be able to access, also having these all available online. And a big part of this project is as well is that we're really um, embedded in the design team and we're um, having conversations with the community, with the design team there, and we're also able to go into the the planning um, the planning meetings and the design team meetings to say what the community are what their priorities are and how that can shape the the, the development. Um, I'll flick through the next few slides quite quickly, conscious of time. Um, the, like I said, this is moving into remote engagement and thinking about the fact that coronavirus is is cropped up on us and um, meeting indoors is no longer uh, the norm. The street is becoming a democratic space for all and um, we're now thinking more about our outdoor spaces. We're challenging the convention of public and private space. People are bringing people to their, to their front yards, their gardens and, and the streets are yeah, becoming much more important. And next slide. Um, and uh, in terms of our high streets and things, we're now thinking we need more space on our streets. We need to make things more pedestrian friendly, cycling friendly, because that's the way that we're needing to get around. But there are these temporary measures like you were showing in Hong Kong of cones and, and things that don't it kind of encourage that kind of uh, nice experience of pedestrianisation. And, and if you move to the next slide, you'll see that I'm just kind of uh, wanting to pick up on the fact that the temporary measures are being thrown in place and they're kind of because of the time scales and everything we're we're losing the sense of bringing the community into how to make these better but these images kind of show how we can start to shape that and the next slide shows Barclay Square which is a landowner slash developer project that we've been working on of public realm improvements in Mayfair where they're prioritizing pedestrians the construction liaison group was set up with Mayfair residents to understand what their priorities were for the street and to design that and think about how the construction would impact them, keeping them informed. And, and that's kind of good practice of how we can move forward with that. It also shows a public art feature um, that was introduced as part of the scheme to celebrate the area and things like that that give a sense of ownership to the community are really, really valuable and important. Uh, flip to the next slide, please. So our response in general to um, kind of remote engagement and the way we're working with people is that we must continue to create opportunities for people to um, be involved, even though it is remote. Uh, sorry, I've lost that slide, Michele, can you pop to the next one? Um, and again, remembering that there are diverse needs. So um, imagine for Cambridge Road Estates, a lot of residents did not have access to internet or computers. The developer gave people laptops so that they could engage in the process. Um, obviously, that's just one small example, but you know, making sure that the digital tools that we're using are used conscientiously and not just ex thinking that everyone can access it, um, and it can't replace human interaction. So, like you have in Hong Kong, we've got the the telephone line; people can email us, and there's still all all those ways that we can be contacted. Next one, please. Next slide, please. 
so we did develop an engagement toolkit and the next slide shows um, just a few examples of that digital exhibitions audio narration so that um, uh, and teleconferencing phone communications video conferencing animations which are really really useful for kind of getting the really com what can be a quite complex planning and development process across in a really friendly and accessible manner um, also having the online surveys and keeping printed communications as a, as a constant as well. Um, so if you pop to the next few slides, I'll just click through those quite quickly. Sorry, so uh, yeah, we're saying it's not a one size fits all approach. Um, digital and traditional conservation methods do have to be combined and both can be constructive, create, constructed creatively to ensure that they're enjoyable for participants. And if you pop through, there are just some some image examples that I'll just uh, say a few words to. So be creative, physical and digital can work. This was a um, festival uh, celebrating the local community for a huge new master plan development. And we had young ambassadors that were there um, <laughs> and, uh, posting to Instagram. Again, when you've got a printed communication, we also have a QR code that will take you to the digital version. Next slide. Um, uh, online surveys, like I said. Next slide. Uh, also, been doing virtual walk and talks so that people can talk us talk to us about their area without being completely removed in the remote kind of uh, conversations that we're having. Next slide, please. Also having VR, helping people imagine what their new space could look like. That was, that's been a huge thing that's run through some of our projects as well. Um, and is really helpful in this remote um, way of engaging. Next slide, please. The, this was a, a huge new local plan and we put ourselves in a, in a shopping centre where there's a lot of footfall, um, obviously pre-COVID, but these things can still happen online with a live chat, someone there with big maps and plans um, helping people understand what the what the new ideas could be. Next slide, please. Again, animation, a great way to narrate um, the plans and help people understand and also putting a, a face, a recognizable community stakeholder face to, to these ideas is great. Workshopping ideas can still happen online, as you can see, we're still here, knowledge sharing and all of that. Next slide, please. We're almost there, we're almost there. <laughs> Sorry. And of course, in public places, when that's possible again, we love a good pop up. We would pop up with a van um, with loads of information about the new plans, activities for children, activities for families, and it's a moment to stop and share your views on things. Um, and that's just another way to engage, uh, hopefully, when we can be in person again. And my last slide just kind of shares um, what we've learned from, from the communities in London about the key contentions that we've seen, which are density, height, light, privacy, fire safety, a huge one, um, accessibility, security, open space and sustainability and the, the full sustainability agenda. And um, what, what we've kind of taken from that is that there's a need to understand public need create a sense of ownership in the process and then ensure that there's social value out of um out of the, the development um no matter what thank you so much for your time thank you very much gabriel um i'll just stop sharing the screen now uh so we go back to the uh screen view with the speakers uh i think uh the presentation was very interesting to highlight how in exceptional circumstances, the work of public engagement can still go on and uh, innovate, which is quite interesting. And there were, uh, there were really interesting uh, um, parallels with uh, Jeffrey presentations in terms of um, making the most of temporary uses. I guess that uh, under the current pandemic situation, uh, these temporary uses are uh, becoming also a ways to experiment new sustainable uses in the streets. So that's that's really quite interesting. I have so many questions for uh, the three of you, 
However, I think it's a good opportunity to maybe uh, read some of the questions that we have received. I think that there was quite a bit of interest in your presentation, Kate, and particularly one question I think is relevant for the three of you. Uh, someone asked, uh, someone noted, noticed that um, the people in the pictures you have shown were uh, younger than what uh, one would expect in, in engagement exercises in most places. So I think that engaging young people is a particularly challenging thing. Do you have any comments on how you managed to do that? And maybe it's something also the other speakers want to reflect on. Yeah, thank you for your question. And uh, maybe I'll share first. Um, uh, for engaging young people, uh, yes, it's actually a challenge in Hong Kong. I think it's part of the culture. Uh, most young people in Hong Kong, they just uh, don't want to join any community event. They just pass and they don't join. So the first uh, challenge is to attract them to really join their own community event and uh, try to do something for their own communities. And this is uh, very much uh, to do with the promotion or the type of uh, the printing materials that we use so to attract them. And secondly, for really, really young, um, uh, 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 young like children or how to engage young children in this process. And we try to uh, develop some uh, game like uh, engagement method, like a design buffet. We try to, uh, for example, in the transitional housing case, we try to uh, put all the uh, elements of uh, good housing, for example, the public space or any public uh, furniture and uh, the, 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 the greening, uh, like the trees, the scrub, or a lawn, or, or the uh, other like computer rooms, or, or that kind of, of uh, common facilities, we put it all in into small uh, paper cards. And so we put it down like a buffet table, so they can go over and they can uh, take what they like for, uh, for their ideal housing. So uh, we need to innovate on our engagement method so as to really engage uh, young people. And for really, really young uh, children, uh, we would um, try to do it as a family unit so the parents can uh, do it with them. Uh, it, it is a good way to um, really uh, communicate between uh, like different generations and uh, to, uh, to build a consensus uh, on a family basis. So uh, maybe I hope I, uh, my advice is uh, useful. Mm, okay. Absolutely, uh, thank you. Um, my, my, my point of view is that we do need to appreciate the youth values. We, we're not creating value for them, but we do uphold and appreciate their values. For example, we have uh, in DVLC, we do invite the local artists, which is uh, most of them are young people. We have a uh, busker. Uh, we have also the ex gamers uh, to enjoy the place. Before we talk to them, we do invite them to, okay, so you enjoy the place to feel the place first. Yeah, and we create a dialogue between of us and them, and then uh, we try to engage them to say more. Okay, what was your feeling of the place? What is your suggestions for the future at the rural central? So it's it's kind of a a, a long term process that we can build up the trust between uh, the young people and the planners. So I think um, for the young people, it's like that, and for the I mean young kids, very young kids, we our target is their parents. We do engage their parents. Okay, come, uh, we have a carnival uh, over the weekend. So do come and enjoy uh, this place. Yeah, so I think uh, we have different strategy to target uh, different kind of people. So I think uh, my advice is like that. Yeah, thank you. Gabriel? Yeah, I would oh. Sorry, I was muted. I was just saying thank you guys. I would agree completely that, that there does need to be a, a kind of separate approach for young people. And that all comes with being able to front load the, the consultation process and have more time to um, make sure that it, it's a two way process. So, for example, with the Olympic Park, I was part of that Legacy Youth Board. It was also about capacity building for young people to understand the planning and development process and the design process and going on site and really understanding how that works um, and then going into deeper kind of workshops and thinking about how um, how the new space can develop can benefit them as well as the, the communities that um, they, they know so well that they're experts for and then for children it's all about making it fun and engaging and 
um, holding, so for the New York Quiet, it was a fun day with a giant map on the floor where they could walk around and talk to us about how they use the spaces already and then how we can reimagine those spaces for them. Um, so yeah, I'd agree with you guys that it, need, it requires a real, um, uh, what's it called though, uh, valuing that, that process and, and giving it the importance it requires. Uh, there are, of course, many other interesting questions, and I'm really sorry that we have um, overrun a little bit, so we won't be able to cover all of them. But I want to remind all the attendees that this uh, webinar is being uh, recorded and will be available on RTPI's YouTube channel. And if you would like to contact the speakers, uh, we can pass on any further questions. And I would like to thank you all of you again for being here today, and hopefully, this is the first of many engagements across the UK and Hong Kong. Thank you very much.